Welcome to our next mini series within the larger teaching series. Over the next number of weeks, we are going to be looking at the Lord's Prayer, the famous Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, because most of us memorize this in King Jamesian. So we've got thine and thou and hallowed and all of that part of this prayer. Um, and even if you don't have a faith backdrop, you know this prayer. People just know the Lord's Prayer. And so I'm really excited to jump into this. In fact, at the very end of last week's episode, as we were tying up the Bread of Life series and we were talking about how we've been given both the Word and the Holy Spirit to live out to God's calling in our lives to faithfully walk after Jesus, I said that the most significant thing we can do to orient ourselves to this reality is to say the Lord's Prayer. And I believe wholeheartedly that it's a complete summary of Jesus' entire ministry. That when you look at the whole storyline leading up to the point that Jesus enters in in human form, he has a mission and he is bringing the story to a climax in his life, in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, and in his ascension. And that it is all wrapped up actually in the Lord's Prayer, and it gives us wisdom and direction for how to carry the story forward. Now, for maybe many of you, you hear that and you go, really? That's all in the Lord's Prayer? It is. And this is one of the unique facets of the Lord's Prayer is that it's so familiar to us that I believe that in many ways it has become unfamiliar to us. That we just know it so well that we actually don't realize we don't know it as well as we think. And I think that has to do with the fact that familiarity breeds unfamiliarity. This is something that Dallas Willard talked about. You know, I was thinking about this not long ago and... Two years ago, we were moving to the Nashville area. I was just kind of recalling this recently. But from two years ago, when we were coming to the Nashville area, we were looking for houses. And so, you know, we were constantly, while in West Michigan, you know, on apps looking at houses that were popping up for sale in this area. But because we had the idea of, you know, for sale signs on the forefront of our minds, even while we were in West Michigan, driving through Holland, like we would see all of these houses for sale and it's like, these four sales signs are everywhere, but I don't notice them unless I'm in the buying mode. And so they're, they're there, um, but we just don't notice them. They're familiar, but they're actually unfamiliar until our mind has been reignited to look for it. And I believe that this is one of the things that's going to happen in the midst of this series is that we are going to be reignited to understand the power of the Lord's Prayer. Not only because in our familiarity, I believe it's become unfamiliar and we're going to, you know, restoke that fire. But I also believe, as you will likely agree, is that once we set this prayer in its context, there is a depth and nuance and meaning to it that most of us have never actually seen in the Lord's Prayer. And so those working together, I believe, is just going to make this a really dynamic and really helpful series. And when Jesus gave the Lord's Prayer, um, I believe he actually gave it so that we would say it. Uh, it sounds a little bit comical, but here's one of the things we see from the early church. This is from an early church document called the Didache, um, and the Didache, some date to 50 AD, so contemporary with Paul and his missionary journeys. Some other scholars dated into the second century AD, but either way you shake it, it's an early Christian text about how you know followers of Jesus were supposed to, to re react and interact with other people and things that they were supposed to do. And at the very beginning of, um, in Didache 8, it starts talking about the Lord's Prayer. And in 8.3, it just says, pray like this three times a day. So the early church prayed the Lord's Prayer three times a day. 
Now, I don't know if we need to be saying it three times a day. Maybe it would be a good idea for us to do that. But here's one of the things that I have been convicted on as I have been putting together this series is that I believe Jesus actually wanted us to pray this prayer daily. And the reason why I have been convicted is because this has not been a prayer that I have said daily. Uh, Maybe for some of you, you do say it daily. Maybe for some of you, you say it weekly, you know, typically on either a Saturday or Sunday, you know, at your church. Maybe you end your services. Maybe it's part of the liturgy of the particular tradition that you're part of. Um, But for me... This is a prayer that, that I understood well just because context is, is, my, is my world and I, I love that. And I've actually learned a lot um, in preparing for this series. But what I was most convicted on is that this isn't something that I say um, or used to say on a daily basis. I now say it on a daily basis and I actually believe Jesus wanted us to pray this prayer daily. Um, and so that's what, that's what one of the things I'm going to um, invite you into doing as well. Now, when it comes to the Lord's Prayer, it actually shows up in two locations. Um, it shows up in Matthew chapter 6, and this is the one that we typically know well. Um, and this is where, you know, when we learn the Lord's Prayer, we've learned it from Matthew 6 in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, but it's also actually found in Luke chapter 11 as well. And so I put these up side by side. I know maybe for some of you it's going to be hard to read because the text is small. But I didn't put this up so you could necessarily read the text for this slide. I just wanted you to see them side by side and just to go, hey, Luke's is just a little bit more streamlined. It's shorter. And we don't know if, you know, Jesus gave these on two different, you know, occasions and gave a more shorter version that Luke recorded um, or if Luke was just you know synthesizing a little bit more for his audience we don't know but it's it's the same prayer Matthews just has a few extra words but all of the main concepts um, are there and so I want to talk in a few moments about the context of both because I think that's helpful for us as we're kind of reacclimating ourselves to the Lord's Prayer but the one thing I just want to point out is that at the bottom of both of these we don't have for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen or for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen And we know that from the saying of the Lord's Prayer, but it's actually not in the earliest manuscripts. In fact, in this form, we don't see it until sometime around the 4th or 5th century AD, depending upon how you date the manuscripts, Um, but it's much later. Now, interestingly, in the Didache, that early Jewish Christian document talking about followers of Jesus, they actually have the Lord's Prayer in Didache 8, 1 and 2, and at the end of 2, they have, for yours is the power and the glory forever. So it doesn't have, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The kingdom part isn't there. But we do have some kind of, you know, ending, if you will, that was added on that's almost kind of like an encapsulating kind of summary, you know, charge as you end the prayer. Now, this isn't something that they just haphazardly put on. This is language that they're drawing from the life and ministry of Jesus, but it also seems to be language that they're drawing upon from King David. So Jesus was a son of David to come and rule on David's throne. And right before David dies, we read this in 1 Chronicles 29, 10, and 11. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours, Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. And so to say for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, it's just a really beautiful summary statement, if you will, um, of what was already said about God and what Jesus came and demonstrated in his life and his ministry, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Um, And so that is added later, but it's got biblical language wrapped up to it. 
Okay, so real quickly, um, Luke chapter 11, I just want to read um, the first verse because this here, the Lord's Prayer, is in Luke 11, um, verses 2 through 4. So here is just the first verse that opens Luke 11. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So the context in Luke 11 is that the disciples see Jesus praying and they ask him to give them a prayer like John gave his disciples, talking about John the Baptist. So two facets of this that's really cool. The first is that John gave his disciples a prayer that was a prayer for his discipleship group or his Talmudim, as we would say in Hebrew. And Jesus does the same. So apparently rabbis had a prayer that he would teach his Talmudim, and that if somebody else heard, you know, one of the disciples saying that prayer, they would go, oh, they belong to John the Baptist's group, or they belong to Jesus's group. And so, this is the prayer that is not only, we say it's the Lord's prayer, it's yes, Jesus's prayer, it's also our prayer. It's a prayer that Jesus is living out, but it's also a prayer that he's calling us to live out as well. And so, those kind of go together in that way. The other facet that I love about the context here is that Jesus is praying and his disciples say, will you teach us how to pray like you're praying? Now, it wasn't that the disciples didn't know how to pray. They knew how to pray. They were saying, Jesus, help us to pray how you're praying. How are you engaging with God? Teach us to do that. And here's what I love about this, this aspect is that for many of us, prayer is a challenge. It's tricky. Um, you know, for, for, for some of us, you know, we wake up in the morning and we're racing into our day or we've got things to do and we feel bad that we don't really pray. And then you're like, well, you know, I'll just pray, you know, before I go to bed and then at night you're too tired and you're like, well, I'm not really present. So maybe this isn't really going to count. So I'll just go to sleep and I'll start over the next day. And for many of us, you know, we pray, you know, when we're getting ready to eat, uh, because that's what you do. And then for some of us, we're going, yeah, I'm just kind of saying the prayer to get through because I'm really hungry or my kids are yelling or they're, you know, know, uh, being very restless at the table. And it's like, I need to feed them before everybody starts going after each other. And so it's just, prayer can just be this challenging thing. And for some of us, when we do pray, it's kind of like a laundry list of all the things that we need. And then sometimes we go, ah, it just kind of feels kind of selfish. Like God's this vending machine. I'm just asking for all these things. And, and, and here's what I love about this prayer is that Jesus gives us a structure. Now, it isn't the only structure. And my hope that as we go through this prayer, that your own prayer life and how you interact with God will just grow and it will deepen. But, but, but what I think Jesus does here is he gives us a structure that we can fit everything that's part of our life into, as well as other pieces that we need to help frame how we come to God in prayer, what we're asking for, how we're thinking about life and what we're called to do. All of that is within the structure of the Lord's Prayer, and I think it's going to help all of us grow in our ability to interact with God. So I love the context of Luke chapter 11. And then it goes on from there, and it tells about Jesus then giving a parable about being persistent in prayer. And so there's, there's an unfolding context in Luke. Matthew's is, in, is in, the, in, the, in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. And so when you see that Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Matthew 1 and 2 is an intro, the birth narrative of Jesus, and then it talks about how he's going to escape and go to Egypt as a child because Herod the Great wants to kill him. And we've explored this before about how Jesus is coming out of Egypt to relive Israel's story, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, in the next episode. But then you get in Matthew chapter 3, you have John the Baptist on the scene, the forerunner of the Messiah, making the announcement that the kingdom of heaven has arrived and then Jesus gets baptized. He is then tested in the desert. And then Jesus says the same message John does about the kingdom of heaven has arised because John has been put in prison. And then Jesus goes and starts selecting disciples. And then the very next thing is Matthew 5, 6, and 7, where Jesus is now instructing his disciples, instructing the people on his mission, this kingdom of heaven, which we're going to talk about this series as well, because that's a central component to the Lord's Prayer. And so Jesus is training his disciples. And so what I love about that is that what Matthew has set up is that everything that has come before Jesus 
um, is foreshadowing what Jesus is going to be doing in his life and in his ministry and his teaching. And because this is the Lord's prayer, the prayer that Jesus is living out and the prayer he's also calling us to live out, he's training his disciples on what it is to be part of his kingdom movement in the larger Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And in the center of that, we get this prayer known as the Lord's Prayer. And so, and this is the one that we're going to focus in on, is the one here from Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus does this Sermon on the Mount. And here is a visual image of the Church of Beatitudes, which is the location um, likely uh, where Jesus gave the Lord's Prayer according to the Matthew 6 rendition. And so I think all of that's just really helpful as we're prepping for the Lord's Prayer. Now, there were other prayers that people said in the first century world. And I want to highlight two of them because it's going to help give us one other key nugget before I give us our push, how we're going to be purposeful in saying this prayer. And one was known as the Shema. And the Shema is just the Hebrew word for here. It's the first word in Deuteronomy 6, 4 that started a series of three passages that were recited every morning and every evening. So it is a prayer, but it's a prayer that it's just strictly biblical passages. And so it's Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 21, Numbers 15, 37 to 41. Shema is something Jesus would have said every single morning and every single evening. And what's interesting is that when Jesus is asked in Matthew 22, what's the greatest commandment? He gives kind of a shortened version of the Shema, which is you love God and love neighbor. And then he says, and all the Torah and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And we've talked about this before in the teaching series, Loving God by Loving Others. And this is encapsulated in the Lord's Prayer. Of course it would be. If Jesus is saying this is what life is about, of course his prayer is going to be talking about how we love God and love others. Uh, but the second prayer is known as the Amidah. And the Amidah is a Hebrew word that means standing. So it's a prayer that is said while standing. Um, it has been the central prayer in Jewish liturgy for over 2,000 years. So well before the time of Jesus, some form of the um, Amidah was in place. And then after the time of Jesus, roughly 70 AD after the temple was burned, what we currently have as the Amidah um, was formalized. And then there was one additional piece that was given because it's known as the Amidah. It's also known as the Shmone Esrei, which means 18 benedictions because there's 18 parts, but there was actually an additional one added. So there are now 19. But in Hebrew today, they just call it Hatafila, the prayer. And it is a prayer that was said three times a day. In fact, in the Mishnah, an early Jewish text from roughly 200 AD, it says in there that you recite this three times a day. And everybody is supposed to recite it three times a day. And you do it while standing. And so this, in conjunction with the Shema, were two staples of prayer life for the Jewish people in Jesus' day. And here's what I want to draw out of that, is that with the Shema, with the Amidah, just with prayer in general, there was always this understanding that you not only pray it to God, asking God to fulfill the prayer, but you always did so knowing you had a part to play in making that prayer a reality. And so I need us to hold on to this understanding that when it comes to prayer, we have a part to play. And that is inherent in the Lord's Prayer. But again, I believe it's become so familiar that it's become unfamiliar. And now we need to refamiliarize ourselves, put it into a context, and allow us to see things we've never seen there before to see just how explosive this prayer is. And so friends, here's my, my call to action for us in the midst of this series, that we pray this prayer with purpose. And when we talk about purpose, I want to talk about this in terms of just very quickly three aspects. Here's the first aspect, that we do so in praying this prayer daily that you would commit to starting to make this a daily rhythm. Find a time where you can say this prayer daily. That you would then pray this prayer boldly. This is an explosive prayer, and you're going to understand it more in the episodes to come, but that you would pray it boldly, passionately, intensely, because this is a significant summons to follow Jesus every single day. And third, that you would pray it collaboratively. 
I wanted to use the word participatorily. It's a little bit of a tongue twister. Some dictionaries say it doesn't exist as a word. Others say it does. But what I mean by this is, remember, we have a part to play. And we're also going to talk about that there's a collaborative, communal nature to this prayer at the beginning of next week's episode. But I want you to come to this prayer, say it daily, boldly, and collaboratively. And that, I believe, will help us get off to a great start in saying and living out the Lord's Prayer. Well, friends, in a moment, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer to end because we're going to do that for every single episode within this mini-series. Um, but one of the things I just want to mention just very briefly to you is this, is that people ask us all the time, hey, how can we help support walking the text? And there are actually a number of ways. Um, but we have recently been put on Amazon Smile. So if you ever buy anything from Amazon, yes, nearly every one of you, um, you can go to Amazon Smile. It's exactly like Amazon.com. It's run by Amazon. Amazon. Nothing changes except you highlight that you want to support a nonprofit organization, i.e. walking the text, and then every purchase you make, Amazon sends a portion of that to walking the text at no charge to you. Yes, it's like us getting free money for your spending habits. So check out walkingthetext.com slash donate, and there you can switch to Amazon Smile, and you can support walking the text by just doing your every day or every week, uh, or for some of you, every hour purchases at amazon.com. All right, so as we're going to do to end every single episode, here's the Lord's Prayer. For those of you who are listening to this, you will hear the rendition this time, and we're going to do the same every single week. For those of you who are watching, let's say it all together, and we're using updated language. Our Father who is in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. And friends, may you walk out the text well in your life.